are back in the VHS fold. I am VHS Chase. This is Jason Groy Gaston. Why did you make me watch this movie? Because it's awesome. <laughs> if you can't tell, if you can't read what's behind Jason right now, we are going full maximum overdrive. I love this movie. <laughs> Man, okay, let's get into it. I, I, I discovered this sucker on VHS and being a proud Aussie bogan back in the mid-80s, I loved nothing more than two things, Stephen King books and ACDC. And I get them both rammed into this film. I have to tell you a story why I have such a strong emotional attachment to this movie. I saw this movie... After uh, I was staying at my aunt and uncle's house, and as we did back in the 80s, we rented a whole lot of completely inappropriate R-rated horror movies. This was one of them. And we sat down and watched them. I was probably like 12, and we had my cousin with us. I'm not going to say her name because she's a very highly respected uh, medical professional now. And I'm sure everybody would be like, oh my God, were you, the, were you that person that Jason was talking about? Uh, but she was itty bitty. She was probably like five or six. And we're watching this movie, and she's just she's just mesmerized by it. She doesn't understand anything's going on, but she's mesmerized by all the cars that are, that are driving. And at the end, Emilio Estevez faces off against the green goblin truck and he's got a bazooka and he says a line. The line is adios mother trucker, but he doesn't say trucker. And then he shoots the bazooka and blows up the truck. Well, that happens. And she, she starts going, adios mother trucker. Adios, mother trucker. Adios, mother trucker. And she just starts saying it. And of course, we're laughing, and that just makes her say it more. But you know, and uncle, they're they're not into that kind of stuff. So we tell her, shh, 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 you don't need to say that. No, say that. The next morning, my uncle is leaving for work. He walks <laughs> through the he walks through the living room where we're all just like laid out like Jonestown, just you know, because we're that's how kids slept back then. And he says. Arrivederci, everyone. And from this pile of kids, this little girl gets up and goes, Adios, mother trucker. <laughs> and my uncle was a big man. <laughs> he was he was a very, very large man, but he he just goes, Linda! <laughs> Calling for his wife. But we we I'm, still I'm we secretly still hoping on. now. I'm secretly hoping that when she finishes seeing her her clients now, well, Mr. Smith, your blood test <laughs> results have come back. We'll uh, see you next time. Oh, thanks, Doc. Adios, Mother Trucker. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a call sign. Maybe she's famous for it now. Oh, it, it has been, uh, gosh, it's been like 35 years <laughs> since then. And we still, we still had... Hey, Hey, do you remember whenever you said this? She's like, I don't remember any of that. I think you're all just making it up. No, we aren't making no. it up. So, yes, I have a very strong emotional connection to this movie because my aunt and uncle are gone now. And, um, yeah, I just, I love this Well, movie. love it. this film is so, awesome. like, it, it became a cult film, as we know. Everyone kind of loved it, even though Stephen King but doesn't really himself but it's such a Stephen King thing and, and I say that because it's it's what Stephen King is famous for is a very simple silly concept and bringing horror to it if you think about like all of most the Langoliers Pac-Man eating you know reality <laughs> to maximum overdrive with with the conceit is there's a comma every all machines have come alive that is the the exposition you get early on. Yeah, Stephen King makes movies, or Stephen King tells stories the way that Pixar tells stories. Pixar tells stories like, what if toys had feelings? What if what if monsters had feelings? What if feelings yeah. had feelings? Stephen yeah. King just gets on there and goes, what if clowns wanted to kill you? What if a yeah. classic car wanted to kill you? What if a truck wanted to kill you? What if a dog yeah. wanted to kill you? <laughs> And and that's it. What if there was a shop and you bought things and they did bad things? Like, and they wanted to kill you. <laughs> yeah. They're very simple in concept. But what makes it work, what makes Stephen King's stuff work so well, is his character development. 
It's the characters that populate his stories are usually really well defined. You know, I could still remember passages from the book Thinner. Because mm-hmm. that character, I remember just being absorbed with it. Plus, being a little fat kid, it's great. It's great to have a story about a guy who just loses weight. I'm like, like, where's a gypsy? As soon as I got my license, I was trying to run down gypsies. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, this is this idea, and it is goofy concept. But the way the buy-in is immediate with this, with me, because once you go, all right, I'm in. All right, all the I have no idea why the machines are alive, but they're alive. It just starts with this great kind of little montage, uh, which you just showed a picture of with Stephen King, who plays ATM Man, I believe. Yes, um, um yes, no, ATM no, Man. I, I will say, um, Stephen King actually doesn't remember much about directing this movie. <laughs> I'm trying to think, yeah. of, I'm trying to think of a Deadpool and Wolverine way of putting this. Yeah. Um, he wanted to build a snowman. That's right. Yeah, it was a blizzard. Yeah, yeah it was a uh, forest bump. Um, it was straight powder. Yeah, white girl interrupted. Yeah. He well, was into all that. He was into it because uh, the budget was nine million. Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> but I suggest six million of it was used for, <laughs> for yeah, for Barubi marching powder. Either I way, I have an idea. A truck wants to kill me, and it's got the Green Goblin's face on it. Oh my god. <laughs> It is based on one of his short stories called Trucks. Very loosely based on that. <laughs> that sounds story. like a sequel to Cars. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but the idea of it, um, oh my it's, gosh, it, Cars it's so is grand. A, Sorry, Cars is a sequel to Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> Could be, eh? Hey. The the Could machines be. killed all the humans, and now they populate the world. Could be. My gosh, I'm a genius. <laughs> Um, this, oh, by the way, you know, I don't, screw, I'm jumping to the end. The epilogue of this movie made me laugh so hard. <laughs> it's the best because the, the epilogue explains, and anyone who's watching this has clearly seen it. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's, it's ridiculous in the best way possible. Apparently, two days later, a UFO is destroyed by a Soviet spaceship disguised as a weather satellite which apparently conveniently had nuclear weapons and a space laser on it. So the idea of this film is the aliens would send this comet in front or follow this comet. This comet would get all the machines to come alive and kill off the the species so the aliens could eventually land and take over it. That last paragraph is the sequel we should have got. The sequel we should have got because it's a whacked out crazy idea. I love that. I love the ending uh, text because it reminds me of a Simpsons episode <laughs> where all the little boys and girls from the school are stranded on an island and they basically do like uh, Lord of the Flies. And then at the end, the uh, I think it's James Earl Jones does the ending narration and says, and then they all got along until they were all rescued by uh, I don't know, let's say Mo. <laughs> That's <laughs> I just love that. It's like yeah, and uh, the vehicles like came alive because of a uh, yeah I don't know UFO. The end. <laughs> now let's look at the now this by just our description alone, you'd be going ah. Oh, this- Nobody of note would ever be in a film like this. Oh, Wrong. Contrary. contrary, yes. Wrong. We we have we have quite the star-studded cast here, starting out with Mr. Emilio Estevez. Hey, at a time where Emilio was on fire, he was on every boy uh, girl magazine you could think of. He was, had already been in Breakfast Club, Repo Man, The Outsiders. This kid was big, even at this point. Yes. Yes, he was. I have a cast list here somewhere. I had I've it. Got up, a, and I can go it, through it. Okay. Uh, great. Pat Hingle. Oh, yes. Commissioner Gordon. Commissioner Gordon, who played. He was, he was really good in this. He's really, really good in this. He, great he, character. Despicable human a, being. <laughs> and apparently a very close friend of Clint Eastwood's, or was. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I just remember he's him, him and uh, Alfred Gore are like the only ones who stuck around for all of the original run of the Batman movies. Yeah, everybody else just yeah. noped out. Was like, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're like Schumacher's pain. Who cares? So um, we we have a uh, 
we have a before he was a star appearance in this movie that we just found out about right before we started filming. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to put it. I got to put his picture in there. So I'm going to put this picture up. And if you don't Mm -hmm. know who this person is, I want you to just take a few seconds to try to guess who this future icon is. Who could this be? He's very good looking there. Very attractive. But he's also very yes, attractive yes, now. And undoubtedly. Yes, yes, he is. And uh, he gets all kinds of accolades, and he's a, he's just appearing everywhere. He was Breaking Bad. He's in Star Wars. Um, he's doing something with Marvel. Oh, yeah, he's going to be in the new Captain America movie. Ladies and gentlemen. Playing in the boys? Giancardo. Yeah, Giancardo Esposito. The great. Yeah, the great Gian, Giancardo Esposito. There he is. Hey. Who is titled in this movie as video player? Video player. He he. If you have not seen the movie, uh, he's in a he's in the arcade room. The machines start malfunctioning, like the the cigarette machine. You remember cigarette machines, don't you? They it starts spitting out cigarettes. Uh, he he's picking them all up, and then he goes over and touches a arcade machine after saying "Yo, mama," because of course, black guy in the eighties, he's got to say "Yo, mama." Mm-hmm. Gets zapped and he dies. Giancarlo Esposito, the great Giancarlo Esposito. <laughs> but it's not only him in there. You mentioned a show called The Simpsons, and one of the biggest stars of The Simpsons <gasps> puts in probably a scene stealing performance in this movie, Jason. Yardley yes. Smith. Yardley Smith, which she, uh, I, rather unfortunately, she actually despises this movie. Uh, she, don't ask. If you ever meet her, don't mention Maximum Overdrive because she hates this movie, which I think I think this movie is worth watching because she does the Lisa Simpson voice throughout the whole movie. Mm. And you get to hear Lisa Simpson curse at people. Oh, and yeah. it is with a southern accent. And it is spectacular. No, I gotta say, she's married to the dumbest human being on the planet in this movie. It really is. I don't think <laughs> I've got a picture of him anywhere, but yeah, I yeah. Uh, Curtis, 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 Curtis. Curtis. <laughs> Curtis? Well, you're not my Curtis. Where's my Curtis? Curtis. <laughs> she does a lot of screaming in this movie too. She screams a lot. Now the kid yes. in this film, I can't remember what the kid's name was. But uh, yeah, really Deep. like that kid. Uh, he, I, I actually look into this every time I see a, a child actor in one of these movies. I'm just like, what? What are they doing today? What? What are they yeah. up to nowadays? Uh, Holter Graham is still acting. Really? He he really? is. He's had a very. Um, no, I say that his uh, the last uh, the last uh, credit I have for him is 2016. But yeah. he does a lot of stuff behind the scenes, apparently. But he's still in the business, and yeah, he is. Uh, From ERPinformation.com, running a business requires effective and efficient tracking of projects, products, supplies, <laughs> and more. Hey, especially he's, regarding inventory. This is how much Jason loves inventory. the Aussie accent. He's got it set for his Amazon. I got, I got my, uh, max, the maximum overdrive is affecting my Alexas. <laughs> <laughs> it's come alive. It's come Would you alive. like to die now? <laughs> oh, but You're can I tell you about the greatest cameo in this film actually comes from the ACDC themselves who are in the van in the beginning when the bridge opens up. Is oh, yes. Members of ACDC in there. Yes, uh, and what uh, was interesting in, in, in the ACDC van, also. You of, know. Course, of course, of course. And what was really interesting is, at the time, ACDC were known for releasing albums usually every once or every two years. In Australia, it was a massive, massive deal. <laughs> so they released this album called "Who Made Who," and it's a great album. Three probably really great tracks come from that from that album. And little did I know that they had actually recorded that for the film. So Who yep. Made Who, which is the title track of the album, is clearly a song about, well, it's the opening song, but a couple of other great tracks came from this. And it was such a, when I saw it, I'm like, yeah, man, why is it ACDC been doing more kind of soundtracks? Um, and I think the last time we really heard a lot of ACDC was 2008's Iron Man. 
after yes. after this. They seem to be the only ones that really kind of embraced it. But it, but it added a lot. I've got to say, those songs really added a lot to the film. A film that I'm sure in editing, there were a few execs scratching their heads. Um, it did really add a lot. And I, I, I just love the, the way that they use the music in this film. Yes, uh, I, I I have to agree. There were probably a lot of very head scratching moments, and one of my favorite head scratching moments is the the breakdown of the waitress who runs outside and delivers this amazing performance where she she's you can't we made you and she just she absolutely loses Please it. Down. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um uh, Wanda the waitress played by Ellen McElduff. She great. gives her all in this with just the worst dialogue possible. Oh. She commits to it. I know that is the one part of the movie that everybody makes fun of is the way my you. But, oh, you But it's earned in that moment it is earned for her character. Remember she was one of the first victims cuz she gets attacked by the electric knife. Yeah, she had a really bad day. You know. Um let's can we just kind of divert into some of the the way that Stephen King made some of these machines attack people, which I sure. thought played out brilliantly when the kid is riding through the suburbs. Yes, that scene itself, absolutely love it because you see some of the after effects, you know, people stuck in lawnmowers. There's, I mean, you name it, the way people die in this is so inventive. That you it's always out, said. Go you on. pointed out something earlier about an actress who appears in this movie who got a little bit of notoriety earlier, uh, later in life. Ah, oh, yes, we do have. Uh, we do have. Now, she's listed in the cast as woman number two would be Marla Maples, which happened to be Trump's number two there. For a yes. Bit so, you know, a um, little bit of to get handsy on anything that's got a hair heartbeat. <laughs> um but yeah, she she probably it's probably the highlight of her life because surely being married to Trump wasn't a highlight, but certainly being part of this film. You blink and miss it though. You blink and miss it with her in it. See, I didn't even know she was in this movie until you said it. I was yeah, like, oh, I mean she I would have been a model back then, I would say. I would say this was prior. So I'm gonna be honest, I don't even remember what Marla Maples looks like. Yeah. I have no idea. I'm pretty no, sure she no. doesn't remember what she looks like. No, either. no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, ah, yes, Maximum you... Overdrive. I think I was, I think I was married to somebody who was in that movie. Uh, the woman who sounds like Lisa Simpson was that her? <laughs> My Trump impression is terrible. Do you know we've been talking the connections with the Simpsons? Did you know that in the episode Maximum Homer Drive back in 1999 of The Simpsons, where Homer takes a truck driver's delivery and finds out that his truck is controlled by an onboard computer. Yardley Smith, who plays Connie in the film, is the voice of Lisa Simpson in the show. So this film and pop culture has made an imprint. And you know you've made an imprint in pop culture if you're referenced by The Simpsons. Absolutely. It's a it's an Ouroboros. Maximum Overdrive starring a Simpsons character goes yeah. on to be made fun of on The Simpsons that stars the same person. I love the, the cyclical nature of things. We need to cue up George Lucas right here saying it's yeah. cyclical. It, 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 it's poetry. <laughs> I wonder how they got... Um, the release to use the, gray, the green Groblin's face in the front of the truck. I suppose that was the time when Marvel was just giving away rights to everything, right? They I'm assuming cared. so. Um, they actually, I mean, let's take a look at it. I have, it's you, visually so striking, Jason. Yeah, you could you could argue that. Well, that's not the Green Goblin. We we don't ever say it's the Green Goblin. Oh, it's totally um, the Green Goblin. But it, it's totally the Green Goblin. Yeah, I just I, I don't know. Um, yeah. So the the it says here the film crew had permission from Marvel to use the Green Goblin's appearance for the mask. Hmm. The mask survives under private ownership after filming. Uh. Whoa, it's still around. Its original, yeah, it's uh, it was restored to its original look. Uh, it was restored in 2013 because whenever they found it, it was like in a, it was a in a yard somewhere in a in a in a wrecker yard, and it had been burned, of course, because of the climax. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was lovingly restored. So, yeah, it still exists today. It's a really great marketing ploy to have that. You know, the other thing I think is really smart about it is that it was a simple way to establish that that was the leader of that certain band of alive machines. Like, in a way, it kind of helped, you know, make it a bit more, like, real in a way. I don't know the word I'm looking for. It's, um, it's um, the – oh, my gosh. It's the same reason why on the original Battlestar Galactica, the one who was in charge, the the Cylon who was in charge was always gold-plated. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. he's in charge. He's the most dangerous. And, so, and yes, he he's in charge. He's the most dangerous. And he's terrifying. Yeah. He is terrifying. And, and, and he, terrifying. the eyes glow. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it works well because, you know, <laughs> what he's done is such a grand concept. And then these days, if you were to make Maximum Overdrive, they would make it way larger in scale, right? Oh, You'd be seeing things oh, yeah. happening all over the world, right? Big CGI yeah. shots. But the fact that they don't go that way, probably out of necessity, but the fact that we keep it so contained in that truck stop just makes it claustrophobic in a really effective way. Um, and, you know, and where we get to deal with the characters. By the way, that actress, who I cannot remember the name of her for the life of me, Felt like she wrote in one or two more things. She was serviceable in this. Laura Harrington. Laura Harrington. Board. Yes. Yeah. Um, she did not really her. I don't want to say she didn't have a good career because she did. She's she starred in some in some other movies. For example, What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Uh, oh yes. Holly. Uh, yeah. Devil's Advocate. So she's she's got some impressive. Um, yeah. Some impressive movies under her belt. But she never really got the re the name recognition that, uh, quite honestly, I think she deserved. Yeah, well, you know, who knows what this film did to people's careers? Besides, obviously, Emilio probably would have had seven films lined up in advance before he took this yeah. one on. Um, now, did you know there was a prequel made for this? Was there? Old Trucks, which aired on the USA Network on October 29th, 1977, apparently. So there is a prequel that exists to this film. All trucks? Called trucks. Trucks. Okay, I thought you said all trucks. <laughs> no, it's just called well, trucks. All trucks go to heaven. <laughs> after spending humanity to hell. Yeah, so it's basically, it's a remake, and it's more focused on the short story that we kind of referenced before, but it also exists. And one more last bit of trivia for you. In 2020... Stephen King's son, Joe Hill, and we know Joe Hill because Joe Hill was a very successful person in his own right, his son, has expressed interest in writing and directing a Maximum Overdrive remake with some of the alterations to the original material. Please don't. Please <laughs> don't. If you want to make a sequel, I'm okay with that, but don't remake this. It doesn't need it. You know, quite honestly, though, I think there's potential for a remake because we are living in an age where we are getting honest to goodness self-driving vehicles. So, I mean, and and I know that there's lots of proposals to make trucks self self-driving. So, yes. what if the trucks get skynetted and they decide to, you know, let's stomp on? Oh, all you gotta and... you gotta have an Elon Musk type of supervillain, don't you? You've got to have you've got to have something like that, don't you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Um, look, this film is just, if you try to sit there and break it down and fit all the logic together on why didn't they just do this, why didn't they just do that, it'll drive you insane because there are multiple occasions in this film that they could have easily got away with a very smart, simple strategy. Um, but they don't, and I, I'm glad that they don't. And the <laughs> the going through the tunnel underneath and that whole idea of it leading to go to the jetty, which is great scene, by the way, right at the end of the film, it all makes for a good drinking game. Like in this movie, you could watch it. Not 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 like a drink, but I can see you could have a lot of fun with this because it, it, it's a. This is a film that I think. Gets better in a social environment. Maybe that's the better way to say it. Watching it with friends, watching it with people, 
because you can't watch a film by yourself without wanting to turn to somebody and going, what was that? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, yeah. But like, it's delightfully, delightfully bad, delightfully very much Stephen King. Just, just messy, I would say it is. It's just messy, you know? I love it from beginning to end. It's an awesome movie. It's an underrated movie. I, I adore this movie. And I know it's bad, but I adore it. Stephen King, I know you hate this movie. Yardley Smith, I know you hate this movie. Emilio Estevez, I know you probably hate this movie. This movie. I love this movie, and thank you for making it. <laughs> yes. It's a great, I mean, like, again, Stephen King is very well known <laughs> taking simple concepts and really making life out of it. And his instincts weren't wrong here, Jason. That's the thing. Even though they were probably clouded in a white dust, <laughs> some of his instincts with story choices were really good. Like, and it worked, you know. Um, like I said, it's very claustrophobic at times, which is uh, an achievement in itself. I don't think it's horribly directed either. Like, you can see that he knew where to put the camera. Maybe the AD knew where to put the camera, but... Either way, <laughs> like it was, I thought very competently made, and could have been profitable at this point. I mean, I know it wasn't profitable theatrically, but the video sales must be through the roof. Oh, absolutely! I uh, I think about a quarter of the profit made from this movie probably came from me and my family renting this dumb movie over and over and over again. Well, I, once I, when I, can't I tell had you my massive many... DVD collection, I owned this. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many times me and my family, me and my my cousins and stuff, we'd be in the car and we'd see a truck go by and we'd all go, chur, 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 chur. which incidentally, what a great musical cue. I remember the first time I heard that, I just thought, what was that? But then I'm like, chur, chur, somebody's going to die. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it's a great music cue because of that, because it, it gives them like like this guy's a killer, like this thing is a killer, yep. you know. Um, which is never explained why all of a sudden that truck became the leader, or how that. Because from my understanding, right, this because thing just scary. makes this comment just makes everything alive. But by making him the leader, kind of says, well, they're life form on their own even though they're supposed to be a weapon for the aliens to just wipe out the planet. This is where logic, you start to think about it, your nose is going to bleed sooner or later. Yeah, so. logic logic does not belong in a in a critique of this movie. It's just basically, was it fun or was it not? And it was. It was <laughs> it very was much fun. fun. Yes. It was fun. And it is. Uh, it was made for a budget of $9 million and globally made back $7.4 million theatrically. Um, yeah, but, you know, at the end Yikes. of the day... That's, that's almost as bad know, as Borderlands opening. <laughs> but this was what was great about the 80s, Jason, with films like that. You could take a punt of $9 million and know, no matter what happened theatrically that you were most likely going to profit from VHS sales. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So you could take big risks, risks that not necessarily is sustainable in today's marketplace and filmmaking. So, um, um, you yeah. know. I mean, not unless you get a big deal from Netflix where they basically say, Well, hey, that's make the only place you can live. It. Yeah. Isn't it? It's the only place you can yeah. live is on streaming now is where you can get that chart because you're not getting it theatrically so um yeah look at the end of the day this is a film that definitely wor is worth having a revisit because being that it's full coming up to 40 years old it's still very watchable it's paced it very true. well it goes fairly quickly i don't ever feel that it drags down too much i mean 80s films are a little bit so slower, slower paced at times but this thing keeps kind of pumping away um, again, my only criticism would have been, geez, I, I wanted to see the epilogue movie. I wanted to see that. <laughs> you know? Um, but, yeah, this is this is great. This is good. This was good fun. A good choice. 
It's if you're a fan of rock and roll music, how can you go bad? It's got ACDC. If you're a fan of Stephen King, you've got Stephen King way too medicated making this movie. <laughs> and and it's very much his film. And if you're a fan of Emilio, S, like there are lots of reasons to watch this than not to watch this. Yes. You know, I'm I'm looking on here because I'm I'm curious how much it's made from from sales of of VHS and DVD and everything. Mm. And there I can't find any I can't find any definitive uh uh yeah source for Fixed it. Fixed number. But, yeah. Yeah. But I I do have I do have how much it made just recently. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go? Where did it go? Hold on. So video sales yeah. June 4th, 2023. Um yeah. it sold it says um one million seven hundred fifty six thousand eight hundred and one dollars. So and that's just from a month. That's just from a month. So yeah, I would say this thing has probably turned a profit by now. Well, it would probably have been on repeat on the cable. Oh yeah. Like yeah, it would have been syndicated and sold on cable. And then you've obviously got the uh, the, like the big DVD boom when everything was re released on DVD, and we all bought every DVD ever printed, especially in the early 2000s. You know, it made bank then because movies that made no money when in release all started making money in that period because they released yeah. them on DVD. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I know ACDC who did interviews of a talk very fondly about the about the movie and the fact that they enjoyed being part of it and it gave them inspiration to one to make one of their great albums i mean you've got who made who you shook me all night long and hell's bells came those three singles came from that album alone and they're some of acdc's biggest hits so like there's a lot to win about i i i thank you for making me watch this again because i oh, did have a welcome. blast so what, what do you think? Uh, right. What do you think Stephen King's original uh, reaction was whenever they told him he directed a movie? <laughs> did, did, I, did I, I, I did what? what? I did what? <laughs> also, did you wrote what? the second part of it. I wrote the second part of it. Wow, really? <laughs> oh my god! Don't tell me this thing has not gone to print. Oh, why did I write that? <laughs> I didn't even think about that. The book, that's you know exactly which part of the book I'm talking about. <laughs> he um he was up for. Uh, worst director in the Raspberry in the Gold Raspberry Awards for this. So <laughs> I don't think he did a bad job. No. And you think about it, this is Stephen King, right? 1986. So his biggest novels have already come out. Like the his he'd already had his peak prior to this. So of course the studio was gonna go, You want to direct? Hell yes, you direct. Like <laughs> your name alone yeah. is gonna make us money. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, it's bankable, right? He was, you put Stephen King in front of every anything at that point, you, you know, it's a safe bet. But um, yeah, look, delightful, great. It's a damn shame he didn't go back on to direct anything more after this. Because um, I think there was, you know, some talent in there, but uh, he calls it moronic, apparently. He calls it moronic. So, um, and he's not wrong. He's, he's not, not wrong. wrong. But it's, it's fun, moronic. Yeah. It is fun. Exactly. Exactly. I would rather watch right. a fun, bad movie than a boring, good movie. <laughs> and so that's it for Maximum Overdrive. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't awesome. forget to like, subscribe, recommend to all your friends. Watch this video as much as you possibly can. And we'll see you next time in the vault.